Chapter Twenty Seven of Order Number Eleven. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon. Order Number Eleven by Carolyn Abbott Stanley. Chapter Twenty Seven, and Jonathan. They had seen more of Beverly than of Gordon. Beverly had been south with Price had fought on bloody hill the day that lyon fell and had slipped his head into the noose more than once while coming back to recruit he had the gift of persuasion this laughter loving boy and many a man had followed his leadership into the army of the lost cause every trip brought him through jackson county now in north missouri now circling through the river counties they never knew when he was coming hardly knew when he was gone there were bird calls from the pasture that virginia came to listen for then somebody would mount guard while there was a hurried interview down in the woods or out in the orchard or sometimes in between the corn rows where there were no tell-tale listeners he did not come home often to the house there was too much risk and then he did not want to bring retribution on the family for his homecoming but he came to think that he too bore a charmed life and could come and go at will he became expert at eluding pursuit and felt a boyish elation in dangers risked and overcome he was there just the week before gordon came home on his furlough staying longer that time than he had ever stayed before it was the first time he had seemed reluctant to go back war was a dreadful thing after all he told his mother he would be glad when it was over she remembered afterward that during that visit he used to speak to her sometimes rather abruptly after intervals of silence saying mother as if he had something of moment to say and then making some light remark that did not accord with the sober look on his face it went to her heart to see him lose the buoyancy of youth and take on the seriousness of manhood of course it must come in time but it seemed to be coming so fast it was the shadow of war she used to think with a sad shake of the head war was a blighting withering thing she asked him one day if he ever heard from gordon now yes he said he had had a letter from him a few weeks ago but he did not tell her what was in the letter nor offer to let her see it virginia was present when her mother asked the question and it seemed to her that beverly looked a little embarrassed when he spoke of gordon's letter she wondered why they did not see him for a long time after this the corn was getting its first ploughing when he came again and this time it was for a flying trip he and ike swamscott had been north of the river recruiting the confederacy was in desperate need of men now they were to start south in the morning and in the meantime were to spend the night at mr swamscott's the negroes were still at caswick and there seemed on that account more danger there than at the swamscott place where the negroes were gone the trevelyans had gone down to see beverly taking sally devereux with them and when colonel trevelyan said it was time to be getting toward home the girls decided to stay all night at mr swamscott's earnest invitation seconded by beverly and ike stay verge beverly whispered in virginia's ear there is something i want to tell you he looked so strangely agitated that she wondered with vague alarm what it could be the trevelyans said their goodbyes outside the swamscotts had sympathetically said theirs within sally casting in her lot with them indeed it seemed probable that sally might be induced to do this for all time ike swamscott was almost as handsome as beverly in his gray uniform at the beginning of the war and sally knew that the heart beating under it was twice as warm for her as beverly's had ever been or would ever be so as the uniform began to grow ragged sally began to think more of the heart under it it is hard for a girl to hold out against a love like his 
he had told her once that it had grown with his growth and strengthened with his strength and when he wrote to her after one of her periodical refusals that he still loved her as tenderly as infinitely but as hopelessly as of old sally cried over the letter for a week and gave it up that plea had touched her heart and made it his all of which explains why sally was not now at the door with the trevelyans when his father and mother were gone beverly stood with his arm close around virginia and she looked up into his face expectantly there was something there she had never seen before she shivered a little before it he had been quiet all the evening little like the rollicking beverly of old but now he held her passionately to his heart as if he feared that something might slip in between them that would hold them forever apart what is it brother she asked an undefined fear knocking at her heart and demanding to come in a fear that was so much worse because she did not know of what she was afraid you have something to tell me yes he said i have something to tell you he drew her cheek to his and patted it as one would a child's but verge little burgie her eyes filled it was her baby name the one his infant lips had given her he used it always when he was tenderest of her it will hurt you dear will hurt you cruelly she closed her eyes and bent her head to the blow it was gordon she thought of the letter that beverly had had from him beverly knew something that he had kept from her because he could not bear to hurt her and perhaps too from love of his friend i ought to have told you long ago he said with stern self-accusation i ought not to have let it go on keeping a cowardly silence you cannot blame me more than i blame myself she drew herself away from him with a fierce impatience she had stood all she could what is it she cried passionately tell me i can stand anything 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 if i can only know he took both her hands and held them tight virginia before i tell you let me beg one thing don't think too harshly of poor lois lois it was it is always the man he went on bitterly that is the most to beverly a quick sharp whisper came from behind them and a hand touched him come in here quick they slipped through the half-open door it was mr swamscott the house is surrounded go in the sitting-room and take a book or something there they are now at this moment two federal soldiers appeared at the front door another entered through the room they were vacating when they met in the sitting-room they saw a family quietly reading and two farmhands lounging in the background their chairs tilted back against the wall there was no time for hiding and no chance for flight perhaps they did the very best thing after all the men belonged to jennison's command and were in search of nothing more than shelter for the night it was a harmless errand apparently but everybody in that room knew that if the identity of the farmhands was disclosed their lives would not be worth a picayune in the face of this perhaps because of it the visitors were politely received and entertained after the first frightful moments were passed they all noticed that virginia was missing but the peril was too imminent to risk the introduction of a new element of danger such as a question might prove the explanation of her absence was this as the soldier had entered through the side door of the dining room virginia had stepped back into an unlighted corner and so escaped notice when he was safely in the other room she slipped out and across the porch on which she and beverly had been standing a moment later she was flying down the road the swamscott place was but half a mile from mr whalen's that distance was never traversed in much less time if she could only get mr whalen the boys might yet be saved every feeling of virginia trevelyan's nature as she sped along the dark road was held subservient 
to the pressing need of saving beverly every conscious thought as she galloped back behind mr whalen was of him and yet through it all reiterating in her subconsciousness was one word and that a name lois if a popular vote had been taken on grand prairie as to the guardian angel of the community it would certainly have been awarded to mr whalen the good neighbor who would have died for the union and who lived for his friends not till the final casting up of accounts will it ever be known how much he did toward the saving of life and property was a widow's last cow taken by ruthless hands mr whalen was never too busy to attempt its rescue was a man's life endangered mr whalen stood ready to swear him off it must be admitted that his oath was a somewhat facile thing in those days though men had been wont to say in times past that his word was as good as his bond and his notes never went to protest there were many dark pages in that four years record but darkness shows us worlds of light we never see by day for those whose memories are good those pages are illumined with kindly deeds and heroic acts that stand out like the exquisite coloring of an old-time missile wrought with painstaking care by some medieval saint the neighborhood animosities of the earlier years of the war had passed away in the frightful community of interests and dangers of this later time then it was a struggle for opinion now it was for life in those days men of differing political creeds shunned each other lest friendships be sacrificed in these they sought each other's homes for mutual safety war makes strange bedfellows in jackson county union men and southern men forsook their homes and lived together for a protection one to the other all that a man hath will he give for his life mr whalen had once taken the wife of one of quantrell's lieutenants and conveyed her and her children to a place of safety in illinois she was his neighbor she had come to him in terror of her life and he could not say her nay it's a poor widow woman that wants to get to her friends in the north he said to the authorities and they let them through it wasn't so far from the truth either he said in recounting the incident one day at caswick she'll be a widow before it's through mr whalen said mrs trevelyan at that time doesn't it hurt your conscience to tell an out-and-out -out story to save your friends not a bit not a bit he replied cheerfully unless i get caught at it then it hurts me powerfully and he threw back his head and laughed heartily a moment later he added seriously no mrs trevelyan i feel no more compunctions of conscience in throwing jennison's men off the scent than any other hounds they're not fighting for their country they're here for what's in it and that means plunder and pillage if i can save a friend's life or his property from those red-legged devils by an innocent lie that don't hurt anybody i'm going to do it and take my chances with the good lord i think he'll say well done good and faithful so when mr whalen shuffled into the swamscott sitting-room speaking to the family in his homely everyday fashion nodding carelessly to the two hands and giving a cordial handshake and a how are you gentlemen to the soldiers it will be seen why there was an instantaneous feeling of relief mr whalen would get them out of it some way they talked for an hour the new visitor rather monopolizing the conversation because he was afraid to trust the family but taking pains to draw the older one of the soldiers into it he related stories in which general ewing and colonel jennison and colonel anthony's names appeared familiarly and his own incidentally he was known throughout the country as a staunch union man 
the hands sat somewhat back in the shadow and naturally took no active part soon after mr whalen's arrival virginia had come in from the back with a plate of apples which she passed as a daughter of the house would then she took a seat near one of the men sally was seated by another the soldiers were young and the girls did their best at last mr whalen rose virginia thought heavens is he going without doing anything well boys he said i'm going at that corn in the morning i want you there by daybreak you're through with them i believe you said mr swamscott at the door he turned come to think of it i don't know but you'd better go over with me tonight hotel swamscott seems pretty full just now how is it mrs swamscott i reckon it would help me out a little she had presence of mind to say i have been wondering where i would put them all they got up and said good night as farm hands would an hour later they were on swift horses headed southward beverly you fool said mr whalen impressively don't you let me see your face around here till the war's over now go but beverly's face was seen again he could not stay away end of chapter twenty seven recording by john brandon chapter twenty eight of order number eleven this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox .org. recording by john brandon order number eleven by carolyn abbott stanley chapter twenty eight fightings without and fears within virginia trevelyan did not sleep much that night with the quieting of her active fears the ones that had been held in check became rampant what was it beverly had had to tell her that he knew would hurt her hurt her cruelly was what he said it was something about lois chandler that much was certain oh if he could only have finished now it might be months before she would know for they seldom knew where beverly was long enough to write to him she went over every word he had said every look on his face every tender caressing motion he had made as if he would shield her from something that threatened her what was it what could it be that he blamed himself for not telling her before and so the weary hours wore on she woke sally once with her restlessness what is it verge nothing but i can't get to sleep oh don't worry about them they are safe have you said the multiplication table yes well said sally sleepily try the sheep i have but they won't stop jumping then intermittently sally was almost off now get up and bathe your face and say and say your prayers and virginia bathed her face and said her prayers more than that she prayed and prayed desperately she told nothing at home of what beverly had said to her it was nobody's concern but hers she told herself and hers it should remain and as the victim of a mortal disease instinctively guards her secret and hides her pain so virginia hid hers and let it eat into her soul if she had only told her mother but she could not she had never told her mother even of her love how could she tell her now of the blasting of it she could only think and think and think and go to bed to dream of it and rise up again to think such a conflict is hard on a girl virginia grew thin and hollow-eyed in all her dwelling on this subject she had never had a thought of anything worse than that lois by some charm of face or form had won her lover away from her 
that she had been able to do this seemed so astounding that she thought of it in a kind of dazed bewilderment it seemed inexplicable that gordon of all men should have fallen under a spell like that then she thought of what she had heard some lady say once about how men often passed by girls of worth and lost their senses over mere physical beauty and lois was the most perfectly beautiful girl she had ever seen in her life she would say that much for her but gordon a man like gordon what could he find in her to attract him except her face she felt strangely humiliated it seemed monstrous to her that lois chandler a girl for whom she had always felt a sort of condescending pity should suddenly step to a place beside her as a rival and when it was all over between herself and him as of course it would be would he ever marry lois lois chandler she said it with scornful emphasis there came to her just then the recollection of something miss nanny had told her years ago about a conversation that she and beverly had had once about this very thing she had forgotten about it entirely or thought she had sometimes things lie dormant in the mind a long time and then wake up as fresh as ever but if gordon had fallen into any such infatuation it was probably more her fault than his she had wondered sometimes if lois were not a little vain she was so pretty yes probably then all at once beverly's words came to her with a new a sinister force it is always the man that is the most to to what to blame was that what beverly was going to say and to blame for what the flitting of a base thought came to her she clenched her hands and stared about her feeling stunned no she put the very suggestion from her with a sick loathing it seemed to her white innocence like an emanation from the pit girls were not as wise then in the ways of this wicked world as they are in these days when they know more than the mothers that bore them the searchlight of newspaper comment and feminine gossip had not then been turned upon virtue and its lamentable lack as a topic of absorbing interest virginia and sally and the rest had been shielded from much that blights by simple-hearted mothers who said wisely or unwisely take your choice between the terms whatsoever things are pure my child whatsoever things are lovely whatsoever things are of good report think of these things perhaps they were wrong the mother of us all gained insight when she ate of the tree of knowledge but it blasted eden the suggestion that came to virginia she spurned as dishonoring to gordon and to herself beverly could never never have meant that her cheeks flamed that she should have had such a thought but a doubt injected into the mind at exactly the right moment is a very persistent thing virginia could not stamp the life out of this one try as she might she thought about it telling herself it could not possibly be until it grew to fill the universe one day she and miss nanny were sitting together with no one else around virginia sat facing the sun which hung in the west a great fiery disk just above the horizon she had one eye closed and her finger held close to the other so close that it shut out all the glory of that western sky aunt nan she said did you ever notice that you can let a little thing like the end of your finger come between you and the sun till you can hardly believe that the sun is there yes often you hold your finger so close to you that you see things out of proportion but the sun is there just the same and everybody else can see it and you could see it only you have this thing in front of you that shuts out everything else her voice had an eagerness unusual in those days exactly said miss nanny things are not really changed by our way of looking at them but they are changed for us 
so that sometimes we don't really see them as they are sometimes yes she was silent a moment and then she asked aunt nan do you suppose anything ever gets in front of our mental vision and comes so close to us and looks so black that it shuts out the light in the same way so that we can't see things as they are i don't know what you're driving at virginia but nobody ought ever to see black things and call them white right is right and wrong is wrong and you can't make anything else out of them no matter how you look the bible says woe unto them that call evil good and put darkness for light does that answer your question no said virginia sharply it doesn't answer it at all not at all and miss nanny was pretty sure from the emphasis of her denial that it did it was not long after this that mrs trevelyan said to miss nanny nan i believe there's something preying on virginia's mind have you noticed how thin she's getting and how little she eats oh nonsense returned miss nanny who had noticed it with growing concern but did not wish to let her sister-in-law know it it's because there's nothing left that's fit to eat you can't expect anybody to have a ravenous appetite for cornbread and rye coffee it's your imagination i'm not very imaginative do you suppose it can have anything to do with gordon i often wonder how much there is between them i used to think there was a good deal said miss nanny or would be some time but here lately she seems so indifferent when he is spoken of that i hardly know what to think he writes to her just the same yes but i don't think she writes to him as often sometimes i have thought that she really does care for him and is worrying because she feels that we would not approve of it because he is on the union side but dear child i don't believe it is that it is more likely to be some little misunderstanding between them those things seem wonderfully big to a girl of virginia's age sometimes miss nanny gave a ghost of a sigh she had been virginia's age herself once and a little misunderstanding had arisen that had blotted out the sun for her she thought of what virginia had said the other day she had been wondering about it ever since suppose you ask her about it sister betty don't let it go on mrs trevelyan shook her head no nan every heart knoweth its own bitterness and a stranger even a mother intermeddleth not she felt intuitively that this was not a matter for even her light touch but her heart ached for the child with the thought in her mind that she had suggested to miss nanny she took occasion to speak much with her daughter about gordon dwelling upon his gentleness his consideration for those of low estate and his perfect truthfulness miss lavinia used to say when there had been any trouble wait till gordon lay comes i'll get the straight of it then she always felt that gordon was so perfectly trustworthy so little governed by passion of any kind it was always principle with gordon lay she used to say virginia listened to it all without reply it was as when the virtues of the dead are extolled to those that are bereft if only he were dead instead of false she might listen to it all and be comforted one day when they were alone her mother spoke to her again with kindliest words of gordon she wanted to make it clear to virginia that no differences of political opinion were as anything compared with nobleness of character he is so careful of the reputation of others she said that is a rare trait my child a chivalrous trait you know how he always defended lois chandler when people called her bold after that foolish affair of the readings he was talking about her the last time i saw him the time you missed seeing him and he spoke so beautifully about her being motherless it really quite touched me virginia rose with a look of dumb pain in her face that smote her mother's heart virginia my child what is it tell your mother 
and let her help you it is nothing mother nothing at all i am only tired i think i will lie down a while and mrs trevelyan felt herself shut out ah how true it is and how hard it is that we who have borne the pangs of maternity and would brave death if need be for our children may not always in the crises of life enter into their holy of holies end of chapter twenty eight recording by john brandon chapter twenty nine of order number eleven this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by john brandon order number eleven by carolyn abbott stanley chapter twenty nine the perfect love that casteth out fear and yet it was through her mother that peace came to virginia at last things had gone on this way for weeks letters came from gordon but they were not answered she felt that she could not write what could she say the family always asked affectionately about him when the letters came more so now than ever it seemed to her she had never known before how much they thought of him one day colonel trevelyan said to her mrs trevelyan had been talking with him virginia there are few such men as gordon lay of course he and i do not think alike on political questions but such differences seem less important to me than they once did i have come to feel that nothing counts much in the choice of a a friend but honor and integrity my daughter if he was going to say more but the look on her face stopped him they had all had a hand in it now but miss nanny and miss nanny proposed to have she did not intend to see virginia's life wrecked for want of a warning i don't know what old maids are for she said to herself grimly if not for lighthouses to warn other people off the rocks so as they sat together one day she said abruptly virginia i never told you how i happened to be an old maid did i no said virginia with interest i have often wondered aunt nan well i'm going to tell you and she told the story that had been much in her thoughts since her conversation with mrs trevelyan of the misunderstanding and the angry words and the pride that would not give in on one side and the obstinacy that held out on the other until finally there was a ring returned and letters asked for and the thing was over it really is not much of a story after all she said to tell but verge it changed life for both of us virginia's eyes were brimming it might not be much of a story but it seemed the tragedy of life to her aunt nan she asked when she could trust herself to speak did did the thing you heard about him affect his character not at all said miss nanny that would have made it very different it was just a case of a girl's pride and a man's obstinacy as most of them are she did not press the application she had made up her mind to supply the leaven and let it do its own work and as virginia tossed on her pillow that night she thought but her case was so different oh if it was only pride they heard from beverly occasionally down in arkansas but he never referred to the matter that he had begun to speak about that night one evening mrs trevelyan and miss nanny sat sewing carpet rags it seemed imperative to have another carpet for the recollection of the wilton in the parlor had proved too much for tiger man and he had come back for it the pier glass felt lonely without it and really he argued without the furniture that went with it 
the trevelyans did not have as much use for it as he had which was true in a way for they had no house parties now at the last moment there was a pressing call from mrs taggart for more rags and they had dropped everything to supply the demand virginia had read to them a while as they worked but she soon stopped and sat with the harper before her and the page never turned she could hardly have told of what she was thinking to the dull pain of a few weeks ago had succeeded a dull apathy it seemed to her sometimes that there had never been a time when she had not had this gnawing pain she was getting used to it she said to herself a little drearily as she had heard of women married women learning to bear meekly things they could not remedy she wondered if it were a kind of paralysis of the emotions and if she would ever feel anything again very much she finished a page and then discovered that she did not know one word of what she had read she turned resolutely then to the beginning and started again she would not give up to such dallying she had got halfway through the page with somewhat better results when her attention was arrested by miss nanny's voice saying with a bitterness new to it no i don't i think god has forgotten there is such a place as grand prairie in his universe don't say that nan mrs trevelyan's soft voice was protesting well sister bertie it's enough to make anybody think so here we are sewing carpet rags to cover our bare floors and that thief tiger man and his gang sitting on our wiltons and three plies we've served god all our lives and sometimes when i look around and see how the wicked prosper i think we've served him for naught no we haven't we don't serve god for wilton carpets and mahogany sideboards that wicked thought of yours nan is no new thing solomon knew of it and answered it thousands of years ago and his answer is just as true today as it was then though a sinner do evil a hundred times and his days be prolonged yet surely i know that it shall be well with him that fear god virginia was listening with an intentness that precluded the idea of emotional paralysis as the proper diagnosis of her case there was something in miss nanny's rebellious protest that found an answering chord in her own breast do you know why he said that nan her mother asked a light shining in her eyes that irradiated her humble occupation and seemed hardly of the earth no said miss nanny unconvinced and rebellious still but he wouldn't have said it if he had lived in this country i know that yes he would nan the wise man had a firmer foundation for his faith than mere seeming appearances might all point to unbelief circumstances might be against him but he was resting upon something greater than circumstance and appearance virginia was listening breathlessly now she knew her mother was talking of spiritual things but she was applying it to her own gropings in the dark and why was it asked miss nanny it was because he could say with paul i know in whom i have believed there was silence then miss nanny could not find it in her heart to answer those reverent words with either jest or scoff and virginia virginia sat motionless into the darkened chamber of her heart where her secret was hidden away there came a faint glimmer of light she did not dare to stir lest it should vanish and she be left in the blackness of darkness again he knew in whom he had believed she shut her book softly and stepped into the hall then she took a light shawl and threw it over her head and went out upon the porch sitting down on the steps between the white pillars where he and she had so often sat there was no moon but it was a starlit night and from all around came the fresh odors of growing things virginia's soul was in a tumult 
she did not perceive the budding of life she did not notice the steadfast stars only one thought was in her mind but that was enough he knew in whom he had believed if this was ground for spiritual faith was it not also ground for human faith the trust of man in man in the relief that came to her with the grasping of this plank amidst a sea of doubts she did not stop to think that she was leaning on mortal man all on the infinite one all knew in whom he had believed and did not she had not gordon lay's life been an open book to her since she could remember and had she ever seen in it anything that need be erased as unfit for a woman to look upon why why had she not thought of this before she had been looking at all the suspicious circumstances that had been thrown around him and not at all at what she knew best of all his own open life that was what she should have looked at she told herself sharply then remembrance came to her of the witness her father had borne to his good name his integrity and his honor of the things her mother had spoken of to her his truthfulness his sincerity his chivalrous care for the reputation of others she even forced herself to face what she had said about his plea for lois shrinking back a little and her breath coming hard but holding steadily to her new point of view as the sheet anchor that would keep her from getting adrift again yes doubtless it was this very trait that had led him to seek lois out and try to do something for her what she did not know and did not need to know but something kind she was sure it would be like him to try to help her if she was in trouble then a recollection of beverly's unfinished sentence almost swept her newfound anchor away in a surging wave of doubt she hardly dared to go over that again but she would she would probe this thing to the bottom now she would test her faith by every one of those old doubts and as she went over again that broken utterance of beverly's a thought came to her that almost took her breath away beverly had never said one word about gordon it was she that had put that construction on his words what if beverly had never thought of such a thing at all she could have cried aloud for joy how she had wronged him how hard she had been she had not guarded his reputation as he had cared for poor lois's she found her heart growing tender for the girl she would go and see her and find out what her trouble was and whether she could not help her oh she had been hard hard he would never have condemned anybody unheard like that aunt nan had said a woe was pronounced on those who put darkness for light and called evil good but she knew her bible well enough to know that there was a woe too for those who called good evil and light darkness how blind she had been what if circumstances had seemed against him she had heard her father tell of a man he had known who was hanged actually hanged on circumstantial evidence and it turned out afterward when it was too late that he was innocent she thanked god from the bottom of her heart that she had never made known her doubts to a living soul and never would she had no doubts she would cast them to the winds and throw herself absolutely upon her trust in him and lo with that resolve her burden was loosed from her shoulders and fell away and peace filled her soul in that moment her heart was opened to all the sweet influences of the night 
the budding life around her seemed to throb and pulsate with joy the soft south wind came to her with a message of love from him the stars the same old stars they had watched together o'brien and the pleiades smiled down upon her just as they did then perhaps even now he was looking up to them from the tented field and thinking of her and yes they were the very same that job old job had looked up to when he fought his fight who knows how long ago and in all these ages they had never swerved a kind of spiritual exultation possessed her she sprang up and stretched her arms out toward them as if invoking their steadfastness her head was thrown back her eyes shining gordon she cried in an impassioned whisper gordon though all the world should swear you false her hands were clenched now i will believe you true but alas alas when an act of the will is necessary to faith the foundations are beginning to totter End of chapter 29 Recording by John Brandon Chapter 30 of Order Number 11 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Order Number 11 by Caroline Abbott Stanley Chapter 30 a fearful school and an apt scholar virginia here's a letter for you she took it from her father's hands and went to the summer-house it was from gordon and she liked to read his letters there as she bent over it now an expectant smile on her lips she did not look much like the virginia of a few months ago the roses had come back to her cheek and the gladness to her eyes mrs trevilian thought it was because her mind was relieved about their opposition but miss nanny felt sure it was the leaven of her own little story neither guessing the truth her face was certainly full of sunshine now for the letter said he was coming home it might be a month or two yet but he was coming he was coming the pansies were sending up their sweet breath outside the pansies he had gathered for her the day before he started off to kentucky how long ago it seemed and she had told him her deepest wish was to live where something would happen well she had had her wish she certainly lived where things happened now how silly girls were she thought feeling suddenly very old he was coming yes but there were so many uncertainties in life she had found that out she stepped to the border to gather some pansies she was peculiarly susceptible to odors and pansies always took her back to that day as she stooped over the fragrant bed a noise at the horse block startled her she stepped back into the summer-house and peered through the vines two men on horseback were at the blocks one of them looked as if he might have been wounded she had never seen either of them to her knowledge but when she looked at the older man and he was young one of those vague intangible sensations of recognition came over her which make us feel sometimes that we have lived in a previous state of existence as cats or rats or something it was very absurd but he made her think of the barbecue the two men dismounted one with difficulty and leaning on the arm of the other as he came up the walk he sank to the steps as his companion raised the great knocker and gave a rat a tat tat that resounded through the house while he was waiting for his knock to be answered the man turned and looked around him virginia could see his face plainly without being herself seen and again that strange sense of recognition swept over her though she was sure she had never seen the man before then mrs trevilian herself came to the door and virginia heard him say without preliminaries i want you to take this boy in and care for him he needs nursing the mistress of keswick looked down at the lad on the step who was resting his head against the white column he raised a smooth boyish face to hers with innocent-looking blue eyes cheeks flushed with fever and lips that tried to smile and were too weak he needs his mother virginia heard her say bring him in 
she asked no questions and made no remonstrance a request from an armed man in eighteen sixty three was a command and this one spoke as if he were accustomed to being obeyed perhaps her heart warmed a little to the boy anyway thinking of her own the man raised the sick boy gently set him on his feet and together they guided him in virginia took this moment to follow but almost before they were in the man was out again coming upon her face to face he raised his hat swept a swift glance around the prairie and was gone virginia stood looking after him i know now i've seen him she thought but where mrs trevilian was accustomed to being nurse and doctor both for her family her experienced eye saw that this boy needed close care he is a very sick boy she told her husband i think i will sit with him myself to-night i wish he was with his mother before night he was muttering in delirium and they sent for dr lay who is he the doctor asked i haven't the least idea she said one of quantrell's men do you think i don't know hardly i should think such a child as he is but i know this doctor unless you give him the right medicine and i give him the right nursing he's going to die so whoever he is we've got to pull him through i reckon you're right he said she had lost herself for a moment toward midnight when the sick boy spoke she woke with a start he was leaning on his elbow looking at her ma he whispered hoarsely look at my back to humor him she bent over him and made a feint at examination they raised great welts he muttered then he looked up at her with a flash of steel in his blue eyes don't you cry ma they'll never have a chance to the flash faded he had dropped off to sleep mrs trevilian watched him curiously who was this boy and what had happened to him she wondered such a child to be armed they had hidden his pistols as soon as he came the jayhawkers were liable to come upon them at any moment and arms would betray him otherwise the boyish face would certainly disarm suspicion but the jayhawkers did not come and mrs trevilian's nursing won the day the boy was sitting up one morning about two weeks later clothed for the first time and virginia was sewing near him he asked about his pistols they are put safely away ready for you when you go where did you get them you certainly are not a soldier the boyish face flushed with pride i am though i am one of quantrell's men you why you are just a boy a boy's bullet can do as much work as a man's if it is aimed straight besides i'll be sixteen next september sixteen even is entirely too young to be in the army and you won't be sixteen for months yet she spoke severely from the superior age of twenty-one what was your mother thinking of to let you go my mother couldn't help it she was in prison she and my little sister younger than i am and my stepfather when she got out i was gone where is your home in clay county over across the river well as soon as you are able to travel you go right back to your mother advised virginia the brush is no place for a boy like you you ought to be in school for two years yet i'm not going back home i'm going to stick to quantrell to the end they'll never get a chance to beat me through the corn rows again they had asked him no questions about himself and he had volunteered no information but to-day he was in a communicative mood and virginia had a girl's curiosity who beat you through the corn rows the militia they came to our house one day last spring looking for quantrell he had been over on the north side of the river and they thought ma and pa would know where he was and they could make them tell they came out to the cornfield where my stepfather and i were ploughing they took pa and strung him up three times by the neck to make him tell when they got through he was nearly dead did he tell no he didn't know he wouldn't have told if he had known did they do anything to you the hot blood rose to the boy's face they lashed me up and down the corn rows with a rope till my back was in great welts do you call that anything then they made me climb a mulberry tree at the point of their bayonets to see them string my stepfather up mrs trevilian would have stopped this recital for her patient's blood was coursing madly through his veins at the recollection of those indignities did they do anything to your mother they pointed their guns at her and threatened to shoot her if she didn't tell where quantrell was and did she ma you don't know her she said i'm like marion's wife what i know i'll die knowing she's grit clear through ma is well they took pa off and when they got a little way off they fired their guns and we thought they had killed him they said they were going to but they hadn't they just did it to scare us but they took him to prison and arrested ma and my little sister and threw them into prison and then i went to quantrell 
he was silent a moment when he burst forth like the boy he was i'll soon be able to shoot with the best of them i'm not going to stop till i can shoot as well as quantrell and how well can he shoot quantrell oh he pops em every time a clean bullet hole in the middle of the forehead and that's the last of them what virginia was looking at him with staring eyes do you mean to tell me that that man is quantrell quantrell's the man didn't you ever hear the story of how he began it no tell it to me she was as full of excitement now as he had been a moment before the boy leaned forward in his eagerness quantrell was his leader and hero and the story was one to captivate the fancy and fire the imagination of a daredevil boy well this is the way they told it to me he said arch clements and the rest of them i never heard quantrell say anything about it virginia laid down her work to listen away back yonder in eighteen fifty six when quantrell was a right young man he and his brother started overland to california they got as far as kansas near lawrence when a band of jayhawkers fell on them and killed his brother and robbed them and left quantrell for dead but he wasn't i reckon they've wished a good many times since then that he had been well he came to after a while but he couldn't move and he lay there two days and nights by the dead body of his brother keeping away the coyotes and the buzzards at the end of that time an old indian found him and buried his brother and took quantrell home to his wigwam and nursed him back to life the boys say those two days and nights made a demon of that man he wouldn't know it though to look at him he's as mild looking as a preacher virginia thought of the young man she had seen at the barbecue and what gordon had told her afterward about the way he looked at jim baird who was it brought you here she demanded with a sudden fearful enlightenment quantrell there was pride in his tone i tell you quantrell don't go back on his men go on with your story she said there came to her with a rush that was almost overpowering the feeling she had had about this man's some day coming into their lives he was in their lives now with a vengeance if it should get out that they were nursing quantrell's men she turned sick at the thought yes sir that night just made a demon of him he didn't seem to care to live for anything but revenge while he was getting well in the old indian's wigwam he laid his plans he made a vow that every man in that gang should die as his brother had died and how do you suppose he made sure of them i don't know how asked virginia breathlessly he joined the band of jayhawkers himself they didn't know him they had left him for dead you know and he had changed his name and everything like that then he got them to talk about those two men they had killed and how they had done it and he listened and bided his time well one day a jayhawker in that band was found dead with a hole in the middle of his forehead nobody knew who did it and quantrell or hart as he was called then didn't know any more than the rest it was not long before there was another and after a while another and a few weeks afterward another always with the one bullet that had gone home after a while they got frightened and disbanded it didn't make any difference quantrell had them spotted then and the same shot followed them the boys say that whenever he kills a man he ties a knot in a silk cord he carries there were thirty-two of those men they say there are twenty-three knots now one of them was for a man killed over here in this county at a barbecue quantrell had tracked him here i know cried virginia shuddering it was jim baird i was there and heard the shot jim baird that's the very man they say there were two of these bairds they got scared and left kansas came over to missouri and bought negroes and tried to pass themselves off for southern men but quantrell found him he'll find the other one some day well some time before they disbanded he planned with seven of these jayhawkers to go over to missouri to old man walker's and run off his negroes he sent word to walker to be ready for them and walker gathered in his neighbors and when they got there the jayhawkers i mean quantrell suddenly went over to the other side and they killed the whole gang that night seven knots were tied in the cord mercy isn't that awful breathed virginia the boy's eyes had kindled with the recital his cheeks were glowing and his breath came fast awful he exclaimed i think it's glorious he paid them back eye for eye and tooth for tooth he lay back in his chair then exhausted you've talked enough now said virginia hastily she had forgotten about his being sick but there was one thing more she wanted to know you have told me all about quantrell she said smiling and about yourself except your name my name is jesse james he said jesse james it has been 
heard many times since then to the detriment of the state's good name but it was no more that day than john smith the bandit of later years was a beardless boy fresh from the cornfield and the plough he was taking his first lessons in crime when colonel trevilian heard the story virginia had to tell he looked grave i'm afraid this will bring trouble on us he said if it becomes known that we have harbored a man whom quantrell himself brought here there is no telling what it will lead to no i know we didn't know it and couldn't have helped it if we had known it but my dear do you think the negroes generally know about this boy's being here no none of them i think but mammy and uncle reuben and i'll answer for mammy put in virginia and we know that reuben is perfectly trustworthy colonel trevilian asserted but we interrupted you my dear i was going to say mrs trevilian continued that perhaps emmeline being in the dining-room may have suspected something still we have been very careful i hardly think so colonel trevilian shook his head these are the times when a man's foes shall be they of his own household he said yes said miss nanny prophetically and when a bird of the air shall carry the voice and that which hath wings shall tell of the matter well might the trevilians fear End of chapter thirty chapter thirty one of order number eleven this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org order number eleven by caroline abbott stanley chapter thirty one the sack of keswick my hand hath found as a nest the riches of the people and as one gathereth eggs that are left have i gathered and there was none that moved the wing or opened the mouth or peeped isaiah ten fourteen it was the twentieth day of august eighteen sixty three they never forgot that day on grand prairie it was seared into their memories with a red-hot iron it was the prelude to the carnival of blood at lawrence quantrell's forces were gathering for it now from fastnesses along the sny out of the deep wooded glens of the blue men came in twos and threes exchanging passwords and pressing on a band had gone to dr lay's the night before he was at the supper-table when they called him out he went straight to his wife and kissed her good-bye many a last farewell was taken thus that summer oh my husband was her moan my dear be brave our times are in god's hands arm in arm they stepped to the door there was no accusation there was no form of trial or defence they simply shot him down with accurate aim that left him dead in her clinging arms the good doctor who had brought some of them into the world who had smoothed the way of their fathers and mothers out of it forgotten were the hours of patient watching he had given them forgotten all the weary miles he had ploughed through ice and snow to succour them in need forgotten the roses he had called back to their children's cheeks and their gratitude then he was on the other side and they were maddened with the taste of blood ah sherman was right war is hell they buried him the next day under the willow at keswick he had no family burying ground of his own and it was not unusual for that kindly people to offer the hospitality even of a last home to a friend the stricken family was taken to keswick's sheltering roof all differences were forgotten now they had been lifelong friends and he was gone evil tidings fly fast hardly had the murdered man been laid to rest before a mob of infuriated soldiers appeared on grand prairie the news of a union man's death added fuel to a fire already blazing they were on their way to keswick the story of quantrell and the sick soldier had reached them emmeline had been faithless one of those soldiers pressed on in advance 
sparing neither himself nor his horse it seemed as if his object was to get there before the others the little group of mourners had just left the willow and the new-made grave under it and were sadly wending their way to the house colonel trevilian supporting the wife of his old friend whose death was so soon to be visited upon him only virginia had lingered to lay flowers on the mound for the sake of the absent one as she rose her mind filled with thoughts of him and of his loss uncle reuben touched her arm miss virginia he said in a low guarded tone dey's a man waitin down yonder in de pasture to see you a soldier a soldier repeated virginia in amazement to see me there came to her a swift remembrance of how she had gone forth on just such a summons to meet gordon under the honeysuckle suppose it should be gordon oh to be clasped in his strong arms again and sob it all out on his breast she had been through so much then she smiled sadly at her own folly gordon was in mississippi was it a federal soldier uncle reuben he's got on federal clothes honey was uncle reuben's non-committal answer the time had come when no man could judge righteous judgment from the outward appearance the old man was fumbling in his pocket he give me dis yer paper to give you miss virginia i seed him spearin round behind de trees in de pasture when you all was gwine to de grave and i went down dar yassum he's waitin down dar in de bresh virginia took the note with a beating heart it was written on a scrap of paper torn from a notebook and was in an unknown hand there is danger it said for somebody you love if you want to save him come down to the place that the negro will show you and come now it was unsigned virginia thought rapidly who was it that was in danger her father he was always in danger everybody was in danger on grand prairie for that matter could it be gordon after all perhaps he had come back sooner than he had expected and was in the neighborhood even now and this was somebody that renee taggart had sent to warn her she shuddered at the thought or beverly they had not seen beverly for months they did not even know where he was perhaps it was the boy they had nursed jesse james come back to give them secret information of some new danger from quantrell's band was it a young boy uncle reuben noam hits a tall man got beard all over his face seem like i know de favor of dat man but i can't tell whar i've seed him a big bearded man who in the world could it be and what did he want with her would she dare to go down in the woods to meet a strange man then she reflected that if uncle reuben had been told to pilot her it was not likely that the man meant her any bodily harm she picked up the paper and read it again danger for somebody you love come now there was an emphasis on that last part that startled her she looked down toward the woods and then around the prairie the western sky was ablaze with gold and mounting up against that brilliant background was a faint haze of something that it seemed to her darkened as she looked was it smoke uncle reuben she said quietly what is that over there in the west the old man shaded his eyes hit looked to me like dust miss virginia i'm mighty fraid day soldiers kickin up dat cloud she turned toward the woods go on she said sharply show me the way when they reached the clump of haw bushes down in the pasture the very ones under which renee had sobbed her heart out that day so long ago a man got up from a fallen log and stood before her he was heavily bearded and his soldier cap was pulled down over his face he pushed it back and stood looking at her with an insolent smile it was emmons baird he moved a step forward and then stopped warned by a look in her eyes she had drawn herself up to her full height and stood quietly waiting his next move you know me i see he said yes i know you what do you want i want to talk with you i've got something to tell you that you ought to know but i don't want to say it before that old negro you needn't be afraid 
i'm not afraid she said as quietly as if she were in her father's house uncle reuben go over there by that big hickory out of hearing but not out of sight watch us closely and if i motion to you come now what have you to say to me he was looking at her in bold admiration one thing that had kept up his strange infatuation for the girl was her utter lack of fear he had planned this meeting in the woods with the base thought that alone with him an armed man she would feel herself in his power and yield more quickly to his wishes he had expected to be complete master of the situation somewhat to his bewilderment she was as yet mistress of it here she was directing her servant and himself as if the situation had been of her planning what have you to say she repeated say it quickly please for i must go there is a squad of soldiers on their way to this place he said speaking so naturally that she was partially thrown off her guard perhaps this was only a kindly warning after all you can probably see them now out there on the kansas city road they will be here inside of a half hour they are after your father you know what that means she did know the blood of the last martyr was yet crying from the ground i'll tell you plainly that the plan is to kill him and burn keswick they've heard of this house being a hospital for quantrell's soldiers she was listening with strained attention he was just a boy she said we never knew he belonged to quantrell till he was going away that won't make any difference do you suppose you will get them to believe that i know those men i belong to that squad they mean mischief i tell you virginia had not stirred she was as white as a sheet you have come to warn me she said what can i do he took a step nearer his hot breath swept her cheek as he stooped over her you asked me a minute ago what i wanted i'll tell you virginia trevilian i want you i want you for my wife say the word and i'll send those men back i'll tell them i've looked into it and found we're wrong say the word and not a hair of your father's head shall be harmed promise to be my wife when the war is over and i will swear to you that keswick shall not be touched to-day or any other day i can keep them from it if i want to virginia had stood perfectly still during this strange love-making if such it could be called she was almost too astonished at the audacity of the man to try to stop him she turned upon him now with a dangerous light in her gray eyes they looked almost black your wife she said with slow cutting emphasis why emmons baird you are mad stark raving mad do you suppose i would ever marry you a dull red spread over his dark face at the concentrated scorn of her tone and do you suppose my father would save his home at the sacrifice of his daughter's honor i haven't asked you to sacrifice your honor he said sullenly i want to marry you she gave a gesture of impatient disgust some men i know don't ask that as angry as she was the significance of the words did not escape her you think i am not good enough for you he went on he could not fail to see that this was final and like the reptile he was he was gathering himself to strike with an envenomed fang because i haven't been off to college and can't say smooth things like gordon lay oh i know who you are saving yourself for i'm not blind but i'll tell you this virginia trevilian with all your pride and your high mightiness you don't know everything i may be what you'd call a bad man i don't claim to be a sunday school boy maybe i've been a little too free with my gun and rebel cattle but listen to this i've never yet ruined a woman and gordon lay she faced him with white lips and blazing eyes it's a lie she said vehemently a base wicked lie it's worthy of you emmons baird he laughed sardonically it's no lie you'll see ask lois chandler she left him without a word when she reached the house an officer and three men on horseback were standing before the door the fences had long ago been torn down for the convenience of loaded wagons the horses trampled the pansies ruthlessly colonel trevelyan was talking to them and she went straight to his side at a word from the leader one of the men dismounted get on that horse commanded the officer to colonel trevelyan 
i want you to show us the way to john pasco's it was an old subterfuge men were led forth thus as sheep to the slaughter sometimes they came back and sometimes they were left dangling at the end of a rope one never knew which it would be but virginia had reason to believe it would not be the first she caught the man's bridle as he stood there he was mounted on a magnificent black horse which reared as he felt the hand on his bit let go commanded the officer she did not release her hold not till you tell me my father shall be safe the horse reared and came down and reared again taking the girl with him virginia child her father cried in an agony of fear every man in that yard expected to see her trampled let go i tell you thundered the man this horse is a stallion he'll paw you to death her face was white to the lips but she clung to the bit and lifted a defiant head i won't let go until you promise me my father shall not be harmed the beast reared again i promise cried the man good god you can't see a woman killed he looked at her with fierce admiration we'll show you the way said virginia gathering up her hair which had dropped from its fastenings i will go behind my father when they returned the yard was full of men the house had been stripped wagons were driving away from the door piled with the last things that keswick had to give up the negroes were gathering their belongings together with averted faces and other wagons were waiting for them a tiny line of flame was creeping up the wall and the hand of emmons baird held the torch my god groaned the colonel this is the last he pleaded for it then his pride was crushed keswick had been to him as a child he had reared they laughed him to scorn it was a rebel nest they said hadn't he harbored quantrell's men and the women wrung their hands in impotent despair the old man turned upon them at last what mean ye that ye beat my people to pieces and grind the faces of the poor saith the lord of hosts his soul was full of the burning words of the hebrew prophet they surged within him for utterance we take our orders from colonel jennison said the officer on the black horse we haven't anything to do with the lord of hosts and the others laughed you will have cried the colonel in a voice that thrilled with intensity he shook his finger in the man's face he was desperate now it did not matter much what became of him ye have eaten up the vineyard the sport of the poor is in your houses and the lord rideth on a swift cloud in spite of their bravado they were startled by his words they thought of them the next day when the storm broke upon lawrence once only as all this was going on did emmons baird speak to virginia when the flames leaped from porch to roof and the thick smoke poured from every aperture he stepped to her side the wagons were driving off the negroes were gone the soldiers were preparing to leave what do you think now of your choice he sneered better than ever she said defiantly i took you then for a bad man now i know you for a fiend incarnate women don't mate with monsters and at the moment of his triumph emmons baird had the old feeling of defeat i'm not through yet he said grimly and he pointed his revolver at colonel trevilian she heard the click and raised a face of despair to the officer on the black horse he had ridden up to have a last word with her he thought he had earned it drop that gun baird he shouted above the roar of the flames i've given my word to the girl and by god i'll stand by it the pistol dropped you're ahead said emmons baird menacingly but you'll not always be i'll strike you yet there was many another burning house that night on grand prairie they started up like beacon fires by their lurid light grim men with set faces and the hearts of demons rode into the west when the sun went down keswick was a mass of charred timbers its chimneys and its blackened pillars standing guard over the grave of hope colonel trevilian went about the yard like one distraught his home was gone his people were gone he had not believed they would leave him but the love of liberty is as strong as the love of life it is a day of trouble and of treading down and of perplexity he muttered alas that i should live to see it virginia clung to him we will build it again some day father she said with quivering lips when beverly comes back beverly where is beverly hunted like a wild beast ah beverly my son my son he strode up and down before the spot where his roof-tree had been he had borne all bravely until this but keswick was the apple of his eye it was to have been his sons and his sons sons and 
it was gone the wind stirred his gray hairs his head was bared to every blast now a sudden gust brought a shower of smouldering sparks around them he stretched out his arms with a gesture of despair i am poor and sorrowful he said in a broken voice thou feedest me with the bread of tears then his mood changed he raised his clenched hand to heaven let death seize upon them he cried in a harsh stern voice that made virginia shrink from him so little did it seem like his own and let them go quick down into hell father he was not to be stopped the waters of a full cup had been wrung out to him that day let their eyes be darkened that they see not let their habitation be desolate let their children be continually vagabonds and beg let them seek their bread also out of the desolate places yea let them be blotted out of the book of the living father father come and sit down in the summer-house see that isn't burned why here is some of the honeysuckle unscorched and so she babbled on thinking meanwhile in her anguished heart where is mother why doesn't she come she came at last i've been busy making down beds in the loom-house dear i think we are going to be right comfortable after all to-night mammy saved a few things and uncle reuben has been filling a spare tick with straw it's fortunate it is summer oh no uncle reuben and mammy didn't go we'll get along virginia help mammy about the supper will you dear i'll sit with your father in the summer-house a while as we used to do she drew the gray head to her shoulder she did not like the strained look about his mouth mammy said virginia as she washed out some tin cups for the coffee have you heard anything about how the chandlers are getting along in all this frightful time she spoke with studied carelessness mammy shut her lips together and turned each slice of middling before she spoke miss virginia dey's some mighty ugly stories goin round bout dat chandler girl dey ain't fitten for you to hear virginia set the cup down and went outside she did not ask what the stories were is there anything in life more pathetic than women's efforts to be cheerful with fresh graves and blasted hopes around them from where she sat at the supper-table mrs lay could see the weeping willow mrs trevilian the ashes of her home but both smiled and kept the conversation going when the meal was over mammy brought out the family bible which she had managed to save from the wreck and mrs trevilian handed it to her husband we will have prayers now dear and go to bed it has been a trying day come mammy you and uncle reuben will keep together to-night they sat on boxes and broken back chairs around the room in mammy's house that had given them shelter virginia and sally were on the doorstep and the two old negroes outside the window colonel trevilian took the book the sacred book that had come down to him from his father's in it was the family record of four generations there was a set tense look about his face read the thirty-seventh psalm dear or the fourteenth of john he did not heed his wife's words she was not sure that he heard them he turned to job the nineteenth chapter and read in a hard metallic voice know now that god hath overthrown me and hath compassed me with his net behold i cry out of wrong but i am not heard i cry aloud but there is no judgment he hath fenced up my way that i cannot pass and he hath set darkness in my paths he hath stripped me of my glory and taken the crown from my head he stopped every head was bowed they were weeping silently but his eyes were dry and burning he hath destroyed me on every side and i am gone and mine hope hath he removed like a tree he hath also kindled his wrath against me and he counteth me unto him as one of his enemies mrs trevilian reached out and took his hand no father no though he slay me yet will i trust in him she said softly he read straight on his troops come together and raise up their way against me and encamp round about my tabernacle he hath put my brethren far from me and mine acquaintance are verily estranged from me my kinsfolk have failed and my familiar friends have forgotten me mrs lay was sitting on the other side of him she laid her hand gently on his knee but he did not see it his voice rose the bitterness of his tone increased they that dwell in my house and my maids count me for a stranger i am an alien in their sight i call my servant and he gave me no answer his voice broke then the defection of his negroes had been a blow to him he had not believed they would leave him it is a fearful thing to see a strong man break down sally looked at him with fascinated eyes while virginia was sobbing in miss nanny's lap he read the words again with an intensity that was painful i called my servant and he gave me no answer it was more than uncle reuben could bear it did not seem possible to him that this was reading 
it was an appeal and a personal reproach he put his head in the window his black face working convulsively and the tears running down his cheeks when you call me marster i heerd you colonel trevilian closed the book then he spread out his hands and looked around with a pitiful gesture of supplication have pity upon me have pity upon me o ye my friends for the hand of god hath touched me his hands fell at his side and his head upon his breast for a quarter of a century his let us pray had followed the reading of the scriptures they waited for it now but it did not come not once in that quarter of a century had mrs trevilian ever taken the reins of family worship into her own hands but to-day as they fell from her husband's nerveless grasp she gathered them up uncle reuben she said lead us in prayer they knelt together on the puncheon floor a stricken band and the old man poured out his soul before god End of chapter thirty one chapter thirty two of order number eleven this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org order number eleven by caroline abbott stanley chapter thirty two order number eleven into the west rode quantrell's band desperate men all past smoking ruins and blackened fields over the border into the enemy's land through the hush of the summer evening that should have spoken god's peace to their souls in stillness of night neath stars that said if only they had listened god reigns be still into the dawn the rosy peaceful dawn they rode lawrence was the acknowledged seat of anti-slavery influence its intelligence directed the free state movement there had been war to the knife between this town and the border in eighteen fifty six marauding bands from kansas had been credited rightly or wrongly to lawrence stolen property had been sold at auction on its streets men seeking to recover that property had been shot down within its borders for their temerity for these reasons it had become an object of special animosity to the long-suffering border and passion is not discriminating by a strange fatality lawrence had been disarmed ten days before they fell upon the doomed city in the early morning when they left it one hundred and eighty men lay weltering in blood jennison has laid waste our borders they said he has ravaged our homes and murdered our kindred we have come for revenge and we have got it a cry of horror went up from the land at that day's bloody work and the border shook with fear they knew retribution would come and that they would be in its track five days later colonel trevilian was on his way to lexington a few cattle had escaped the general round-up and he hoped to get them to illinois the old horse he rode was one that had been left by the soldiers as worn out his own were all gone he had hesitated about taking this trip there was danger to himself in going and danger to the cattle in staying virginia insisted upon accompanying him as far as lexington they would ride and tie she said she would be all right mr merriweather would see that she got home women were the protectors in those days for bad as both sides were they rarely ever harmed a woman they had started and got as far as the first crossroads on the signpost was a fresh-looking printed paper colonel trevilian rode up to it it was headed general orders number eleven as he read it a groan broke from him what is it father from virginia's seat behind him she could not see but she knew it had struck him hard whatever it was he read it aloud headquarters district of the border kansas city missouri august twenty five eighteen sixty three first all persons living in cass jackson and bates counties missouri and in that part of vernon included in this district except those living within 
one mile of the limits of independence hickman's mills pleasant hill and harrisonville and except those in that part of caw township jackson county north of brush creek and west of the big blue embracing kansas city and westport are hereby ordered to remove from their present places of residence within fifteen days from the date hereof those who within that time establish their loyalty to the satisfaction of the commanding officer of the military station nearest their present places of residence will receive from him certificates stating the fact of their loyalty and the names of the witnesses by whom it can be shown all who receive such certificates will be permitted to remove to any military station in this district or to any part of the state of kansas kansas interrupted virginia scornfully except the counties on the eastern borders of the state all others shall remove out of this district officers commanding companies and detachments serving in the counties named will see that this paragraph is promptly obeyed second all grain or hay in the field or under shelter in the district from which the inhabitants are required to move within reach of military stations after the ninth day of september next will be taken to such stations and turned over to the proper officers there and report of the amount so turned over made to the district headquarters specifying the names of all loyal owners and the amount of such produce taken from them all grain and hay found in such district after the ninth day of september next not convenient to such stations will be destroyed the order was signed h hannah's adjutant by order of brigadier general ewing the cattle were browsing by the roadside we will go back honey colonel trevilian said in a dead tone and virginia who had been riding behind him on the worn-out army horse now resting one hand in his pocket to steady herself now balancing without holding on at all put her arms around his waist his voice sounded as it did the night keswick was burned as if something within him had broken the next two weeks were long remembered in jackson county and cass and bates as gabriel and evangeline remembered acadia as the reconcentrados remembered their herding in the cuban camps as the filipinos remember the time when samar was made a howling wilderness the mandate spared none all must go how it did not say there was no transportation provided for them they had no means of providing it for themselves the horses and mules were in kansas the wagons and carriages were with them only those too worthless to take had been left strange teams went out from those counties in the next fortnight counties that had boasted of their thoroughbreds and stock farms a broken-down mule and an ox hitched together or a cow sometimes when the ox was not to be had or a pair of yearling calves yoked in front of an improvised cart anything that had wheels was at a premium women went out trundling a wheelbarrow with their children's clothes in it such as were not already on the little jayhawkers grandmothers rode horseback with a baby in arms and two behind them while the mothers walked and drove the cow that was to supply them with food until they reached succor fortunately there was not much left to transport a few quilts for a roadside bed a skillet and a coffee-pot a side of meat and a bag of cornmeal with such few garments as had not been confiscated these made up the bill of lading in most cases as the days went by the roads were filled with the wretched exiles going they knew not where barefooted women and children stripped of all but a scant covering for their body struggled on through the dust and heat of an august sun behind them were their smoking homes before them the world that was so big they fell by the wayside sometimes and were picked up by pitiful ones who walked that tired children might ride a great heart of sympathy throbbed through it all and the fellow-feeling that makes us 
wondrous kind the story of the little sacrifices made of the cheerful deceptions that did not deceive of the patient bearing of one another's burdens of the lips that smiled when hearts were like lead of the tears forced back when another was looking that story will make beautiful reading some day when the scroll is opened the trevilian said nothing but an old cart left they put to it two yearling calves it was a moderately uncertain team but they were thankful enough to get it in this rode mrs lay mrs trevilian and miss nanny virginia and sally walked with colonel trevilian behind the cow and mrs devereux rode a broken-down horse they had been relieved of the care of the cattle by the soldiers who came to execute the order naturally people going out in wheelbarrows and superannuated carts could not transport much furniture but it was taken care of as the wagon trains with their freight of household goods moving westward attested where life is extinct evil birds congregate they were not lacking when life went out of those homes men were shot down sometimes in the very act of obeying the order of exile and their wagons in effect seized by their murderers then there would be a hurried burial a hasty gathering up of the little that was left and a frantic pressing on officers will see that this order is promptly obeyed said the order they did when it came to the test mammy declined to go miss betty how you know but marse beverly gwine to come back hya some day no i'm gwine to stay right hya dey ain't nothin left fur de jay hawkers to git and i don't reckon dey gwine take off me and de old man from this decision she was not to be moved she was something like a cat about locality in thinking it over it really seemed the best thing to do they knew not what was before them there would be two less mouths to fill in any event you may do as you wish said colonel trevilian you are free now humph grunted mammy i ain't studying bout freedom tis mars beverly i'm thinking bout dat child show to be here directly miss tiny went out on horseback miss tony riding behind her on the horn of the saddle hung an old carpet-bag that held their earthly possessions across miss tiny's lap was the sword general james bascom had written to them for it at the beginning of the war they had replied in a brief note written in the third person the mrs bascom it said acknowledged the receipt of general bascom's letter asking that his sword be sent to him they beg however that they may be allowed to retain it as a cherished memento of a brother who is dead the two ladies followed close behind the trevelyan cart and miss nanny and the girls got a good deal of amusement out of them before they reached lexington mammy and uncle reuben went to the big gate to see them off the road was filled with forlorn little companies bands of soldiers harried them out of the land there was a pillar of cloud behind them a pillar of fire on every hand but alas there was no moses to lead them forth End of chapter thirty two chapter thirty three of order number eleven this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org order number eleven by caroline abbott stanley chapter thirty three a dark-skinned white lady mammy was down in the pasture looking for the old dominica having in the last two years been corralled and fastened for safe-keeping to every piece of underbrush in the pasture the rooster had adopted that umbrageous retreat as his permanent abode and was giving mammy no end of trouble to keep up with him the supply of live stock was now so meagre that she cherished the domenecker 
he and his small harem and one failing cow made up the list if we except a superannuated mule that had been turned out on the prairie to die by some passing teamster when he had procured a worthy substitute it was nearly a week after the hajara the limit was up a few belated ones still straggled along the big road but the greater part of them were gathered now on the river banks in jackson and lafayette awaiting transportation to any point that promised a haven to any friend who could give possible succour the burning of the crops was over the land was laid waste and brought to silence gladness was taken away and joy out of the plentiful field only a few had dared remain old man chandler sullenly defied the law he had done nothing he said that he should be driven from his home he had been loyal from first to last his friends were all in new england he could not reach them if he went into a military post he would starve all he had in the world was here and here he proposed to stay old mr collins was another who was going to try it mammy had heard shots in the night she had not thought anything of it for roving bands of bushwhackers with jayhawkers in nominal pursuit still roamed across the country a man of quantrell's dashing methods cared little for the depopulation of a strip of thirty miles and there had never been anything like a determined effort to drive him out had there been by the silent man who proposed to fight it out on this line if it takes all summer or one like him it would have been accomplished nobody supposes that it would have been impossible to exterminate two or three hundred men had there been a strong purpose to do it but no man that warth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life remarked paul to timothy many years ago the good soldiers from kansas had entangled themselves with the impedimenta of pillage and always it was the old plea made two thousand years ago and behold as thy servant was busy here and there he the man was gone chick chick chicky chick chick chicky mammy had a pan of meal and was trying to tempt her family from retirement but the dominecker had a wisdom born of stormy times for many of his kind that call had meant decapitation he would wait and see whether it was peace or war on one side of the cow-path was a thicket of haw bushes mammy pushed the bushes aside i laid dat old fool dominecker is hidin round hyah somewhere look like even de fowls don't know who to truss she parted the bushes and peered in the pan of meal fell from her grasp in a pool of blood lay the body of a man his hat had fallen over his face but there was something strangely familiar about the tall form it can't be muttered mammy dem's soldier clothes she raised the hat cautiously a fair young face looked up at her with unseeing eyes it was beverly he was so white and ghastly that she thought surely he was dead the next minute she tore open his coat and put her ear to his heart it was beating feebly uncle reuben was roused by a clarion call as he sat dozing before the cabin door there was no need of secrecy they were alone on the great prairie they held a hurried consultation out in the lot where it had been since last winter was an old sled used for hauling wood of course it had not been put under cover that was not the custom of the country and in that way it had escaped the destruction that had fallen upon the stable the mule was hastily hitched to the sled mammy's feather bed the only one left put on it and on this improvised stretcher the wounded boy was tenderly placed he was carried to mammy's house and laid on mammy's bed and through the night watches her faithful hands ministered to him when beverly trevilian came to himself the next day mammy's black face was bending over him to the wounded boy sore pressed and spent it was like a glimpse of heaven mammy yes honey 
ma'am is here it was what she used to say to him in his babyhood when he woke and cried with fright he closed his eyes and lay still fearing to move lest he should wake and find himself again in the brush his thoughts were confused he could not remember how he got here or or he gave a sigh he was too weak to think after a while perhaps just then uncle reuben who had been gone all morning to mammy's wonderment and somewhat to her indignation appeared in the doorway his wife could see from his face that something had happened she shook her finger warningly and hurried toward him what is it she whispered supposing it was nothing less than another visitation of jay hawkers but it was not a threatened danger this time to her or her charge dilsey de jay hawkers done shot old man chandler de jay hawkers why he's union ain't he in her excitement she raised her voice beyond the safety pitch and the sick man caught the sound what day wanna shoot him fur dey say he's been harborin seshus old man chandler i never heerd of him harborin anything before who was it dey say some young man been consortin dar and de federals dey got wind of it and lit down on him dis mornin and dat was de last of him you don't mean dey killed him dey shot him down like a dog i got dar jess as dey done it mammy cast an anxious glance toward the bed her patient lay perfectly still whars de girl settin dar by her pa's dead body dilsey dat girl ain't shed a tear dey's a mighty curious look in her eyes look to me like mammy they started beverly had raised himself on his elbow and was staring at them with horror-stricken eyes he had caught snatches of what they were saying what is it tell me tell me i say as they hesitated go on said mammy to the old man the mischief done did now and uncle reuben told the tale when he had finished beverly trevilian sank back with a groan for harboring rebels and he wouldn't give the name my god my god the old negroes looked at him wonderingly death in every form was so common in those days that they had become habituated to it they could not understand his excitement uncle reuben he was on his elbow again and his voice had the old trevilian ring of command take the mule and bring lois chandler here tell her i sent you make haste there's no time to lose tell her i will see that her father has proper burial and then you attend to it go on uncle reuben looked at mammy he was not quite sure that his young master was in his right mind and mammy always solved his doubts the old woman was looking at beverly with professional eyes now she hardly knew herself whether this was sympathy or delirium go on he cried don't stand there gaping at me mammy came close to the bed marse beverly dis ain't no place for dat young girl right now she spoke respectfully but firmly i reckon reuben better take her over to old mr collins's they won't turn her off no no he said vehemently she's coming here there is no other place for her this is her rightful place uncle reuben tell her i said so she must come there was a rebellion in mammy's face that had never been there before in all the years she had served this family marse beverly she spoke sullenly with a look of suspicious resentment in her countenance what is dat white woman to you dat you bound to have her here whether or no her look was a revelation to beverly trevilian it showed him the depth of the shame and contumely his folly had prepared for the innocent what is she to me he said wildly mammy she is my wife End of chapter thirty three